pre-Victorian or pre-Elizabethan, pre-Tudor, like, you know, because it's medieval, so it's more like, oh my god, I need to get out of this rabbit hole right now. Sun and Moon Reads. Hello everyone, welcome, my name is Sun. Today I am reviewing the third book that I read in the month of October, and this is the one that I am particularly excited to talk about. It is Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. It is the first book of the Farsia trilogy and one of many, many books in the realm of the Elderlings. Now, I keep saying this because it is true. I am pretty new to fantasy reading, so I never thought I'd be in this position reviewing this iconic classic series, a Robin Hobb book, but I am. I'm here and oh my God, it was so good. Ah. Uh, Fits, fits, fits. Yeah, so just heads up, I may just be randomly yelling Fitz's name in fervor and emotion throughout this review. Because I don't think since Jane Eyre, or maybe for some reason I'm thinking Life of Pi, not since those books have I had my heart completely entangled within a character like I have with Fitz. Okay, there are probably readers out there who have not read this book and you're thinking, who the hell is Fitz? So I'm probably sounding a little bit creepy. So I'm going to take a few steps back and start from the summary. This book is very hard to summarize because when you just speak through the plot, it just sounds like a, a typical, almost vanilla fantasy quest story. But it is so much more than that. I'm really concerned that I'm going to do a bit of damage by summarizing this book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a link to an excellent review and summary of the Farsia trilogy by Chris from Chris Bookish Cauldron. He summarizes this series so perfectly and I think it's one of his favorite authors so he provides a lot of insight and just some really really fantastic thoughts. So definitely watch the first few minutes of this video and if you choose to stay and watch the rest of it and leave me here then honestly I will not be offended as long as it convinces you to pick up the book and read it. But if you're still here and you're saying, son, that is a cop out, you need to at least give it a go. Okay, so here it is and don't say I didn't warn you. This story is set in a kingdom called the Six Duchies, very similar to maybe the medieval ages in England. We follow the journey of a young boy named Fitz who is the bastard son of Prince Chivalry, one of the king's sons. And we soon find out that this prince has Oh, what's that term when someone in the royal family decides that he's going to give up the crown? What's that proper term? I really should have done my research. Um, whatever that word is, I'll just put it here. Anyway, Prince Chivalry has done that. So young Fitz is dumped at the castle by his grandfather. And so Chivalry's stable man, Burridge, is basically given the responsibility to look after this boy. Burridge takes Fitz to Buckkeep, which is where the royal family lives. So it's kind of like the Buckingham Palace, but obviously it's more pre-Victorian or pre-Elizabethan, pre-Tudor, pre like, you know, because it's medieval. So it's more like, like a stone castle, I guess. Oh my God, I need to get out of this rabbit hole right now. At Buckheap, it's decided that Fitz is going to be trained as an assassin for the king. And he's trained by, I guess, a veteran assassin. His name is Chade or Shade or Shade. No, probably not. So this decision is made. So Fitz is kind of like part of the family, but not. So there's a few fantasy magical elements in this realm. One of the elements is something called the skill, where there's certain people who seem to have the talent who are chosen by the royals to be trained in the skill. So it's a little bit like telepathy, I guess. You can kind of connect with others just using your mind and communicate. And it is mainly used for like warfare and tactics. So basically it's Facebook Messenger, but in your mind. How's it going for you so far? You liking my summary? Do you want me to continue? Anyway, we also learned that Fitz has an ability called the wit, where he's basically Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> oh God. That sounds ridiculous, but what I mean by that is that he can connect and talk and empathize with animals. He just has this extraordinary connection with them, and this connection defies distance geography. Generally, this ability is viewed as quite savage or barbaric and is quite frowned upon. So in this book, we start this coming of age journey of fits, of making his way in life, all the trials, 
kingdom, political intrigue, war, uprising. Um, oh my God, I'm so exhausted. Just watch Chris's video, okay? <laughs> Let's just get into why I love it so much. So I recently read The King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss and it is now one of my favorite reads of all time. So I was on the Rothfuss Cloud 9 and didn't want to come down too much from it. I just wanted a similar reading experience again. And from what I've heard about the Farsia trilogy, it seemed like the next best step. It seemed like it was going to tick all the boxes for me and it really did. It was everything I wanted from an epic, character-driven, hero protagonist, coming-of-age arc, you know, intriguing fantasy world. It had all of it. <laughs> it had a really uplifting, kind of emotional response to this book, uh, which is just what I needed. There are two main things I just absolutely loved about this book. Number one is Robin Hobb's writing. As mentioned before, when you look at just the events and the plot of the story, it does keep close to, I guess, the typical fantasy hero's quest tropes. You know, you have a bastard son with unique abilities. He's trained up by an old hat, a master. There's a section where it's a bit of like a magic school, magic academy with a typical Severus Snape kind of an antagonistic teacher. You have political intrigue of, you know, family members trying to dethrone each other, uh, brewing battles, etc. So on the surface, we've seen all that, yes, but not in the way Hob delivers it. She has this amazing talent of drawing you in emotionally by expanding on and fleshing out in detail, you know, the emotions, the inner dealings, thoughts, turmoils within the characters, uh, particularly the protagonist. Yeah, you get such a rich, deep insight to their inner world as these characters experience these arguably typical tropes or events. And because of this, you have just a very rich and rewarding reading experience. Well, I definitely did. So this kind of emotional mind mapping, stamping is not only in Hobbes writing, but it is an occurring theme or phenomenon, I guess, when you think about the magic systems in the story. The skill is the ability of tapping into other people's thoughts and connecting and communicating with minds. The wit, which is the ability that Fitz possesses, this connects into the life force and the minds of animals. So you can communicate with them, you can feel what they are feeling, sometimes see and hear what they are experiencing. And then there is also mention of these pirates, I guess, called the Red Ship Traders. Now, this part that I'm going to discuss is not really a spoiler at all. It doesn't spoil the main plot. It doesn't spoil Fitz's arc in any way. But it is quite cool how you discover it in the story. So um, if you don't want to know anything about what I'm about to say, you can skip to this time. These pirate red ship traders invade lands and they kidnap village folks, take them back to the ship, and they do some mysterious magical operation. We never find out exactly how or what, but they basically give these victims almost like a complete emotional and moral lobotomy. That's probably the best way to explain it. And so not exactly a zombie because they are physically and physiologically still a human. They look the same and are still mortal, but their souls, emotions, any existence of morals, goodness is all completely wiped out. So yeah, that part of the story was quite thought provoking and quite confronting and, and quite eerie. Bob's writing is very rich in detail, has quite a high EQ, if that makes sense. Therefore, you cannot help getting emotionally invested, wanting the best for the protagonist, wanting the worst for the antagonists, and being completely intrigued by all the characters in between. Now onto the second reason I loved Assassin's Apprentice. In order to explain myself, I do need to refer to the Game of Thrones, the TV series. Now, I was like many who dedicated eight, nine years of their lives watching the Game of Thrones TV series. And it was only my second experience of a high fantasy story, the first being Lord of the Rings. So like most of you out there, I loved it until I didn't, which was in, of course, season eight. We're not going to go into it. There's no point. You know, we are all still recovering from it. But I realized that because of Game of Thrones, I am a little bit damaged and there's a little bit of mistrust that has been created whenever I visit some kind of 
high fantasy kingdom realm story. I often expect to be disappointed, but more than that, I find that I brace myself for the possibility that something shocking, explicit, and just jaw-droppingly horrid is going to happen for no explicable reason or purpose except for the shock factor. You know what I'm saying? So basically Game of Thrones has traumatized me and has molded me into this damaged being that I am now. <laughs> The reason I mention this in reference to Assassin's Apprentice, and I am such a dad because I am actually getting a little bit emotional thinking about this, but I honestly feel like this series by Robin Hobb is going to heal me from my Game of Thrones hurts. There were so many moments in this book I was bracing myself thinking, oh man, something's going to happen to this dude, this person. Just total insecurity about the fate of the characters. But all the circumstances that happen in this book is so poignant and it has a purpose. But hopefully this doesn't sound like um, this book is predictable. It really isn't. There are definitely some shock factors in this story. I mean, obviously I won't go into it because it's spoilers, but the way this book finishes, you just don't expect it. But there was a reason for it. There was a purpose for it. It was, and it was just beautifully rounded up. And apologies again for going back to Game of Thrones, but I do feel like this trilogy has all the things I like about Game of Thrones, the history of the kingdoms, the political intrigue, uh, the character-driven elements of an epic fantasy world. But because it doesn't have an explicit shock for the sake of shock factor, I just feel like I'm in trusted hands. By the way, I reckon some of you out there are probably saying what I have heard before, which is, well, if you were disappointed in the Game of Thrones TV series, you should actually give the Game of Thrones books a go. I did consider it and I did actually start reading it and I read the first few chapters of the first book and I got to the first chapter when we are introduced to Daenerys. And I didn't know this about the book version, but Daenerys is 13 years old in the book. She's basically a tweenie. And so knowing the sexually confronting explicit arc of her character, I just didn't want to read that. And I'm obviously not the only person that felt this. HBO felt it. In the TV series, Daenerys is 17 years old. So it is obviously a very confronting, not quite right thing to watch on screen, right? But for me, when I read a book, I visualize things as clearly as I'm watching it on Netflix. Yes, Daenerys is a fantastical character, it's a fantasy world, it's fiction, I know that, but I couldn't just separate that factor out. And basically I just didn't want to read about a 13 year old going through what she goes through when there really isn't a strong convincing reason why she is 13. That's just my opinion, I just wasn't comfortable with it, so that's why I discontinued reading Game of Thrones and I won't give it another chance. Because I think it's all about that saying, you know, once a fool, twice, what? Oh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It's that kind of thing. Anyway, that was the other reason why I love this book. I feel like it's going to mend my broken heart from my Game of Thrones experience. <laughs> so I loved, loved, loved this book. I cannot wait to move on to the second book, Royal Assassins. I will be doing that in December. Oh, Fitz, I will see you again soon. Okay, everyone, I have come to the end of my review. Please let me know what you think. If you've read it, if you haven't read it, I'd love to have a discussion with you all out there. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Sun. This is Sun and Mood Reads, and I will see you next time. Bye. Sun and Mood Reads.